Hello everyone and welcome to NANO. Today I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Mike and John. And we're going to be discussing uh, degradation of Roma domains today. Um, this, in particular, this uh, paper by Gray and Fisher in, published in 2018 in Nature Chemical Biology. So a little bit of background about Bromo domains. Um, they are approximately 110 amino acids long, and they consist of typically four alpha helices labeled alpha, Z, B, and C, and two loops that join each of those um, helices, Z, A, and B, C. And uh, they recognize acetylated um, lysines on histones, and they help um, control the activation of transcription. They are implicated um, in particular in cancer and inflammation. And today in particular, we're gonna be talking about the BET family of bromodomains, which consist of four members, BRD2, BRD3, BRD4, and BRDT. And today we'll be focusing on BRD4, which actually has two domains known as BD1 and BD2. And in this paper, they were trying to come up with some ligands selective in particular for the BD1 domain of those two. Yeah, I think it's really <laughs> interesting that these <laughs> BET family members have these two bromo domains, BD1 and BD2. And while those mm -hmm. domains are fairly different, within the BET family members, for instance, the bromo domain one, the first bromo domain, are pretty similar. So I think it's also interesting to see how Gray and colleagues managed to get BRD4 selective BD1 inhibitors or protax. So it'll be really exciting to see that today too. Yeah, and I, I do think it's uh, really interesting that despite having like these different conserved regions as well as their general function being rather similar as far as how they you know modify and understand different histones, the fact that they're still able to direct to very specific you know cell functions where you know four is definitely more related to proliferation, the activation within the cell cycle, whereas two and three are involved in very different activities, despite them having a lot in common, just really provides this interesting landscape pharmacologically, making this a really interesting but difficult target. All right. And at the top of the structure in magenta is actually the um, BRD4 BD1 domain, um, and this is an X-ray crystal structure in complex with a starting um, inhibitor that they came up with. And basically, it's it's a protac or um, proteolysis targeting chimera, and it's basically a bifunctional molecule um, with this linker in between. Um, JQ1 is the name of the ligand that is selective for um, BRD4 BD1 to some extent. Um, and then lenalinamide is a well-known um, imid, which is selective for cerebron, um, which is also known as a decaf or DDB1 and cul 4 associated factor. And that's what we see kind of towards the bottom is a crystal of, of DDB1. Uh, the red and the gold are the beta propeller subunits and the uh, gray part is the C-terminal domain. Cerebron, which we see in the center here, <clears throat> the C-terminal domain is what interacts with lenalidomide. And um, I think there's a zinc atom on the other side, John, if you want to point that out. Yeah, and the N-terminal domain is in blue here. And the, um, the helical bundle domain is in light blue in the center. So let's take a look at some of these interactions a little bit more. And so, so Maybe. Carla, in nature, cerebron mm -hmm. doesn't degrade BRD4. Is that correct? That it, That's correct. it doesn't have yep. a, a way to do it. So the idea here is, can we have this protac that will bring together a protein that we want to degrade that, that usually wouldn't interact with this particular E3 ligase, and it'll pick up interactions, and it will allow that to be ubiquinated and uh, decomposed, right, or de degraded? Exactly. That's right. And I'll point out a little mm -hmm. bit more about the uh, lenalidomide binding site. So um, the thalamid portion of lenalidomide is thought to be the pharmacophore for recognition by cerebron. 
And there are actually three tryptophan residues that uh, it interacts with, which form what's called the tritryptophan pocket. One of them is 380 here, another one is 400. Um, this, and then the other one here is 386. And there's 386, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and it also forms a network of hydrogen bonding interactions with the histidine 378 turns out to be pretty important and this serine 379. Um, and then there's more of a, a hydrophobic pocket up at the top for the thalamid ring. Um, it interacts with the histidine 353 via uh, a hydrogen bonded network actually and this proline 352. So now I'm going to bring this down a little bit more so that we can look at the JQ1 molecule, which is a uh, thiophenotriazolo uh, diazepine ring structure. I guess the, the first thing that always strikes me is uh, when seeing groups of aromatic rings and seeing how all of these are kind of coming together, you can see between this uh, tyrosines, both of these at uh, 97, 139, we can get right down into here and we can see there's lots of interesting interactions, but the one that caught my eye the most that I just thought was really fun is we have an offset pi pi interaction right here, followed up by a perpendicular kind of below sort of sandwiching tryptophan 81 and just such a, in a way that I hadn't really uh, thought about before. Yeah, and I can also so see a couple of hydrogen bonds from the carbonyls to uh, amides on, on the BRD4, asparagine over here and glutamine over there. So the authors took kind of an interesting approach to designing a specific inhibitor for BD1. Um, it turns out that BD1 and BD2 uh, possess about 49% sequence homology, but almost none of that is in the um, alpha, uh, C-alpha loop or the Z-A loop, which um, you see here. So instead of actually optimizing the ligand itself, what they did was uh, change the linker length and also points of connectivity of the linker to the protac molecule and um, and try to observe the effect on the protein-protein interactions and approach the selectivity from that perspective. So I'm going to um, show some of the compounds that they made on the PDF back here. And what we've been looking at is DBAT23. which is up here, um, which is actually has a degradation um, half maximal concentration or DC50 of about 50 nanomolar for BD1 and greater than one micromolar for BD2. So it, it is already somewhat selective um, and it has a linker of about eight carbons. One of the other molecules that they really focused on in the paper room that we'll look at next is this DBET 57, which you can see um, in this case, they put a really short linker um, for the protac, and, but it, it comes off of the diazepine moiety in this case, instead of the thiophene as it did for BET23. Uh, now this molecule um, <clears throat> turns out to have a DC50 of around 500 nanomolar for BD1, but it's almost uh, completely inactive at BD2 which is kind of interesting, so that they felt that the linker length could be quite important for selectivity, um, both restricting the confirmation of, of uh, the interaction and also the uh, per residue interactions, just limiting them. Hmm. Should we look at DB57? Sure. Now, one of the really interesting things that immediately jumps out at you about this structure, and we can overlay it with the one for um, DBAT23, is actually the, um, the confirmation of cerebron. As you can see, the um, C-terminus still interacts with the lenalidomide up there, but there is almost no interaction with the N-terminal domain. So mm. there's no association between um, BD1 with the N-terminus. So this was one of the reasons they postulated that... Um, you know, the short linker could still result in degradation, um, but that, you know, the confirmation of cerebron might actually not be that critical. Wow, that's just, I guess that's just the, one of the really interesting things about protein-protein interactions as well as protein-protein, you know, try to pull these together and really being able to 
find out that we haven't necessarily optimized, even though it's a more natural confirmation we were looking for, they were looking for, but being able to say that it's still very active, still capable of uh, bringing about, you know, effective degradation. That's true. And it is interesting to me that, um, you know, this resulted not just in the presence of the shorter linker, but also in the fact that it's the point of connectivity, as I mentioned, is different. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I would guess the JQ1 sits differently in the pocket then. Is that mm. the case yeah, or does the linker it's... just come out differently? And they did do some mutational work, which I... I highlighted some of the residues in cyan here, like the slicing 91, which they implicated, I think, in being important um, for the protein-protein interaction with the yeah. N-terminus. And then, yeah, you're right, John, there's an aspartate yeah. 145 that turns out to be important for recognition with the JQ1 portions. Yeah. And that actually, I believe, was conserved in both of the two structures. We can overlay them. I don't know if we can oh, see wow. that. Oh, wow. Well, it's just so interesting to see just how much, yeah, the confirmation has shifted for so many of the other residues, but how in a, in a few obviously key regions, we're seeing lots of, you know, sort of conserved effects, such as, you know, farther over to the side here, we see how close they are. Whereas up here, we're seeing some much larger shifts. That's just really yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's almost a completely different orientation of BD1 at the top. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I wonder if uh, an amount of it is just because down here we have so many interesting, you know, interactions between amino acids, whereas up here it just doesn't seem to be as many, uh, you know, of these groups that are defining this structure as much as the tryptophans and phenylalanines down here. It does look like some of those uh, aromatic rings that were kind of stabilizing part of the group originally do, are maintained, but everything around them have moved. Hmm. As you pointed out, Carla, the, the cerebron and terminal domain has shifted, but you know, in DBET 21, there's a, there are important interactions up here uh, that we see between BRD4, BD1, and the N-terminal domain. And now, you know, that's impossible with the N-terminal domain way out here. And yet, mm, and yet a it's still point. a potent degrader. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good point. So then I guess uh, what they did was um, synthesize a variety of different in uh, Protex with different linker lengths and um, tried to do some docking studies as well to come up with what they would propose as the optimal linker length, which they thought was two to three carbons. But their best compound actually ended up being, and I'm gonna turn these off for now. Oh, this one. Oh, wow. Huh. Which actually has a five carbon chain in between the two. And um, they were not able to crystallize this structure but um, they did do a docking study, which I attempted to reproduce using Autodox Mina, uh, which is one of Nanome's plugins. So we'll take a look at that next. And that's great. And this one's back linked through the thyeno part of the yes. thyenodiazepine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the thiophene. It's yeah. similar to the, the initial structure, you're right, Mike. So this was huh. the result of, uh, of my docking study. And... Um, one of the key residues that they pointed out as being important to the interaction is this glutamate, glutamine, sorry, 84 up at the top in orange. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm really interested in seeing is, you know, the end terminus is back right over here, seeing, yeah, glutamine 78 is able to push back in there. The histine 378 also seems like it's able to line up well. Just seems like this is a a very weird mixture of the two views that we just had between, you know, shortening the linker, but same as always, you know, we're able to have this pocket still consistent with these similar interactions down here. The really amazing thing about this molecule is that it has a DC50 of 5 nanomolar for BD1. It is inactive at BD2, and it is also inactive at BRD2 and BRD3, so it's super selective. Wow. 
That's amazing. That's impressive. Yeah. I mean, and I also feel like we are seeing more protein, protein, you know, contacts between all of the domains here as well. That I guess it could be a lot of the uh, specificity could be driven between, you know, these protein interactions that just don't exist in the other proteins. And so it's not just the ligand specificity, but the uh, protein itself that's lending additional specificity. Yeah, so on the PDF over here, I'm just showing uh, the graph for this particular new inhibitor, and you can see the degradation for BD1 um, in orange, whereas in black is uh, for BD2. That is what I would call inactive by comparison. My goodness, yeah. that's, uh, that's really fantastic. So on this slide here, or on this uh, page of the PDF, you can see um, their duct structure. And I just wanted to point out that the residues in magenta um, are actually the ones that are different between um, BRD4, BRD1, and BRD2, and BRD3. And they also point out the, uh, the glutamine. Mm, the glutamine. BD4. Yeah. yeah. Wow. As far as the interaction, like, so kind of showing the direction of like how this is able to line up compared to what we're kind of seeing over here about how it seems like it's oriented just a little bit more to be able to maximize some of that space, which honestly, I mean, this is the craziest thing about Protax to me is just how well that they can do what you don't even think they're going to be able to do. Like you target these two pockets, but really the power of it comes with protein interactions that uh, are just facilitated, not necessarily, you know, able to be rationally uh, predicted, which is just kind of exciting to me, but, yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing. I thought this uh, was definitely worth highlighting in Nanom. And I think, you know, Nanom makes it very easy to visualize all of these differences, um, which I think would lend itself to helping design additional analogs. I'm excited to see it happen. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone.